Um, I hope you're all doing well. Love to be playing baseball soon. Uh, I guess, first of all, uh, we can't give you um, an ovation, but for those of us on, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Pat Hankin and Paul Spoljarek. <laughs> Here we are. Uh, first, to, first, look at Spolly. Hey, look at Spolly, looking uh, dignified. Pat Hankin just got a haircut. Is that true? I cut my hair twice during the quarantine for myself. Today, I actually had a professional. <laughs> let's, uh, Bulldog, let's start with you. Um, and I want to get to your friendship with Spolly and your career. But uh, talk about the strangest time that we've ever gone through in our lives. Talk about how it has affected you and really, in the grand scheme of things, the sport of baseball. Yeah, I mean, it's been an incredible journey. I, I went to spring training like I always do for 10 days or 14 days. And unfortunately, day four, I was sent home. That was when MLB made the decision to send everybody home. And we came back here to Michigan in quarantine just like everybody else did. And my three daughters came home to, uh, all from Michigan State. We stayed here for, I think, eight weeks, nine weeks before we started to get out. They're just now starting to open up the city here where I live. Uh, I'm about an hour north of Detroit. I live about 45 minutes from Port Huron, Sarnia area, and about 45 minutes from Windsor. I'm like right in the middle on the Michigan side. So it's been an incredible run here. I, I, um, I'm like everybody else on the Zoom call. I'm anxious for baseball to start. And um, I'm anxious for just the economy to open up again and get back to normal. Take, uh, from what you have heard right now, best guess is, are we going to have baseball this summer? Uh, great question. Um, you know, we were on a Blue Jay Zoom not long ago, just a few days back, and I, I asked the same question, and there's really not a lot of concrete answers right now. You know, everybody's waiting on the player association and MLB to come up with an agreement. Obviously, as an ex player, I try to see both sides. I try to stay open-minded about it. I try to, you know, I try to think to myself, can't we just both make a compromise, get through the 2020 season, and then maybe go on to negotiate a longer CBA uh, after the 2020 season? And I'm sure there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of smart people there trying to work on it and hopefully they'll get something done. But this is, uh, you know, in 94 and 95, when I was assistant player rep, we went on strike, but it was our own doing. You know, we chose to have the work stoppage. With the pandemic, it's been – it's been really rough, I think, on a lot of people, and I, I hope that MLB gets it together and we play. Yeah, we got a lot of kids and we got parents and coaches here uh, who want to play, certainly. You know, you, you, gotta, you not only think about the pro game, but the amateur game and the kids game, and I want to get to Spalding in a second, but, you know, for the uninitiated who, who, who may not follow and have followed your career, and I, I was lucky and privileged enough to, to cover you, and it was a delight to cover you. You were such a great player, but such a great guy and so good with interviews and so good in the community. But I know Zinger's got some video. Maybe we can uh, just take a little uh, ride uh, down memory lane. I mean, you were the first ever Toronto Blue Jays Cy Young Award winner before Roger Clemens, before Roy Halladay. Um, you're an all-star. You uh, were a World Series champion. You're a member of the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame. You've done so many things. When you look at all of your accolades and what you have done, what is the aha moment for you, the YouTube moment for Pat Hankin? Is it something that – because I've had a couple. One comes to mind was um, when I was a – I played in the minor leagues for five and a half years. And I literally pitched many years in hope mode as opposed to – believe mode and you guys know what I'm talking about I was hoping to throw strikes hoping to do well and I had an aha moment with a guy named Mark Eichhorn he was a relief pitcher and a teammate of mine and keep in mind this is my second big league spring training no third big league spring training I already had a year of AAA under my belt five and a half years in the minor leagues and this is when this happens in spring training he comes in after the game he sits down I said hey I caught you do I knew he did well because we listened to the games back then on the radio in the clubhouse because not all the games were televised. And I said, and I knew he pitched well. And I said, hey, Ike, I said, how'd you do? And he said, I was wild. And I said, wild. I said, I said, how many guys did you walk? He said, I, he looked at me like I was crazy. He said, walk. He goes, I didn't walk anybody. He said, I was wild in the zone. And I remember driving home that day from the ballpark because I didn't pitch in the game that day. And I remember driving home that day thinking, wow, you know, my mindset is so off. I was not thinking that way at all. And I was on the verge of being a big leaguer and potentially being a starting pitcher in the big leagues. 
with this mindset that was so weak and so wrong. And Mark Guy Corn told me that so it's that simple phrase. He looked at me and he said, I didn't walk anybody. I was wild in the zone. Now it's something you hear all the time from, from pitching coaches and you hear it, you've heard it before, but for some reason, this aha moment where it just clicked for me. And I remember driving home thinking to myself, gosh, dang, I got to start looking at this a different way. I got to start challenging myself. I got to start not being happy with just throwing strikes, you know, and, and that's really when my game took off to the next level. So when you ask me about an aha moment, that's it for me. If you ask me about a, a career highlight for me, it's simple. Game four of the 1993 World Series, we come back and win 15 to 14. And the atmosphere in the clubhouse in Philly, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it. We get back into the locker room and everybody's in a circle clapping like, like high school football. It was the most incredible moment of my life, and it was a game that I never even played in. So I always look back at that game. I've talked to my alumni friends, and believe it or not, they all had that same goosebump feeling. It was a feeling that I'll never forget. It was game four in Philly. We come back and win 15-14, and it was a game I didn't even pitch in. Yeah, that, that was a wild one when you think, because you guys were down, I remember. But, hey, t for you to say that, I think that says everything about the kind of team player. You didn't even pitch in that game. You pitched game three. Here's some highlights yes. from game three which still had to be one of the highlights of your career, though. I mean, that was a pivotal, pivotal game. Yeah, I mean, game one, it was funny. that Back then, it was uh, Olerud won the batting title. We faced the left-handed pitcher, and the big story was, is Cito Gast going to play the DH, who's 40 years old and right-handed at first, who never played first base? Or are they going to play the gold glove batting title winner, John Olerud, and have lefty on lefty? He chooses to go with Molitor. First inning, I strike out the first guy. Uh, you know, hearts pounding through my jersey. I couldn't feel the mound. I was just trying to throw strikes and not walk them, to be honest with you. And then I get the first guy out. The next guy up hits a ground ball in the hole. Next guy up doubles down the right field line. The crowd is erupting. I remember Mahler gets the ball in from the outfield. It's second and third, one out the first. He puts the ball in my glove and he whispers in my ear, I'm sorry, I should have had that. <laughs> and, and I remember, because he didn't play first base, right? So he wasn't used to playing first base. I bet you he had 25 games there all year, if that. And um, so those are cool little stories that, you, you know, you, they live forever in my memory. It was an incredible rush. And, um, you know, I went on to pitch six innings that day, and Cito got me out of there after, like, 95 pitches. So I was just happy to be part of that, be part of that club, be called up in that era. It was a great era to be a Jay. Yeah, where are you in that mob scene, that, that, that dog pile with uh, Joe Carter? And I'm not in the middle of that pile. I'm on the outside perimeter for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, we'll – cherish that forever you know you, you go elsewhere you play you still though have that blue jay logo tattooed above your heart what did that franchise what has that franchise meant to you oh great question you know i got drafted out of high school by the blue jays i grew up in detroit i was a tiger fan when i got drafted by the blue jays i thought blue jays where are they you know because <laughs> i only followed the tigers back then and i was never a type of kid that loved to sit and watch the games I love to be part of it. I love to play. But I didn't spend a lot of time watching games as a young kid. So I get drafted, and, and it just it's, it, they've given me everything that I have today. I mean, I still work for the club right now. I work in player development. It's a small role, but I love being part of it. Uh, I do some alumni stuff. But, uh, you know, the day I got traded, and Spully was in the trade with me. We went to St. Louis. And I, I remember my wife and I, you know, back then, you guys are going to laugh, show you my age. Caller ID just came out. And, uh, <laughs> It was my landline, and I remember the GM meetings were in Arizona, and I didn't have a lot of friends that lived in Arizona, and I remember the phone rings, and it's some area code I didn't recognize. I looked at my wife, and I said, I think we just got traded. And she's like, what? And it was Gordash. Gordash called, and he was the GM, and he says, Pat, Gordash here. He goes, uh, I told you to be the first one to know if I ever traded you. He said, I traded you to the Cardinals today. And I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah. And then, he, you know, we, we just talked real briefly, and it was over. And then, uh, you know, a few months later, I go to Jupiter, Florida, instead of Dunedin. You know, and you, and you look down at all that red, and you're just like, what the? You know, I, I just remember thinking this red is just ugly, you know. So the Blue Jays have meant a ton to me. Everything I have is because of the Blue Jays. I love the Blue Jays. You know that. Yeah, I know that. Uh, let's, uh, this is a good time to bring your, your pal in, who has become a, a lifelong friend. Let's bring Spalling in, who all the guys on the call and, uh, and the gals and the parents and coaches all know Paul Spalgerica. 
as a great dad and a great coach and also a great player. When he played in Zinger, you can roll some Spalley video, but let's talk about your connection, Spalley, with Pat Hankin and this friendship that has lasted forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, uh, it goes back to my first year in instructional league when, uh, when, when I had signed. Pat had already been in the organization for probably about two years, I believe, at that point. And, um, you know, we, we met – uh, in odd circumstances, uh, we were, I asked him if he wanted to go fishing. I, 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 he was like, man, I'm from Detroit, man. I don't know anything about fishing. And we, next thing you know, we're out there fishing, having a great old time. And it was a bond that lasts to this day. It's something we both enjoy. And, uh, you know, we look forward to spending time together, talking, laughing, joking about old times and enjoying the, uh, uh, you know, reminiscing about uh, everything. And it just, you know, our friendship's very, very deep and enjoyable. And, and uh, I can't say enough good things about Pat. He's a tremendous yeah. human and a tremendous ball player. So a righty and a lefty can, can get along. Absolutely. Yeah. It is true. Yeah. yeah. You, you I, look I, at your... I, I got a little add to something on, on the trade deal. When, uh, when, we got, uh, when we got traded, I got traded the year before as well. Um, and I was actually out in Arizona it, about a mile away from the New Mexico border in the middle of nowhere, had no idea I got traded. And got, when I got home, uh, my wife was like, uh, you need to call Gord Ash. And uh, can't even remember the, the Mariners um, uh, GM at the time. Uh, you got to call these guys. You, you, you've been traded. I'm like, what? <laughs> So off to Florida, or off to uh, Florida, back to Florida for both trades. Uh, one to the Phillies and one to uh, one to the Cardinals. Wow. Um, I want you guys to kind of go at it a little bit about the, the art of pitching. But first, I think it's good for everybody who's on this Zoom call to get an idea about the turning point for both of you. I mean, all of the young players, you know are impressionable from, you know, 14, and I think we have up to almost 19 or 20 years old on the, on the line who all have baseball dreams. Talk about the dream. Uh, let's start with you, Spolly. Talk about the dream, where it started, when it started, and when that, forgive me, TSN turning point happened for you. And the same thing, I'll, I'll let Pat take it right after that. Well, uh, for me, I think what, after I had made the national team, uh, things started to happen really quickly for me. I, I honestly didn't expect to make the national team here. I'm a kid from BC, uh, just playing local baseball, you know, not really, you know, having much experience, got, got the opportunity and, uh, and really ran with it. I pitched very well. Um, you know, I shut out Cuba in my first year, uh, which I think has only happened one time. Um, since and uh, you know just things really started to blossom for me at that at that point um but when i got into pro ball i was i was a lot like pat i had that same kind of mentality was was you know i, I was just hoping to throw strikes i wasn't being aggressive uh i was letting my stuff do all the talking not letting my my actions take control of the situation and um you know, for me, when it really happened for me was, I think, my first big league spring training. Uh, it became, I remember I was working at Greyhound at the time in the off season, and I got a phone call from, uh, from uh, Mel Queen, and he said, hey, kid, guess what? You're going to big league spring training. And I was like, what? It, what? I, I, I literally, I was flabbergasted. I had no idea. I wasn't expecting it. Didn't think anything of it. I was a non-roster invitee at that time, and, uh, you know, just – had the first time walking into the clubhouse and seeing some of my old, you know, guys that I grew up watching, uh, you know, like Tony and, and uh, it, I mean, it was just, it was crazy. It was just a, a very odd feeling for sure. But uh, it, it took a while for all that luster to wear off and realize that I have a real chance to do something here and I need to take control of it. And, you know, things worked out well for me. Yeah. So Bulldog, take me back to this young kid in Michigan I'm sure you, you, you picked it up like we all do from our parents or, you know, father, son, whatever, little league. And did you, could you ever imagine, Pat Hankin, that your name would be on a Cy Young Award? No, of course not. I mean, I, I, I played hockey during hockey season, basketball during basketball season. I was quarterback on the high school varsity team. Um, I never played organized hockey. I know, I know you guys are all great hockey players. I'm that, not that, trust me. We played backyard hockey. Look, I played all the sports. I, I actually liked football better 
than baseball in high school when I was these kids' ages. I just enjoyed the camaraderie, the huddle, the, the excitement of it. In baseball, I played shortstop up until my senior year. About, uh, we only have 25 games per year uh, for high school, and I didn't pitch till my ninth game my senior year. And it actually, took, it actually took some three days in a row where we had some dry weather. We kept getting rained out, so the other guy pitched. Then we'd get rained out, and he pitched. And, and I finally went into the coach's office and said, look, I pitch in summer ball, and I'm, I'm, I'm doing, I was doing pretty good. I can pitch. And he's like, all right, well, then I finally pitched. Through a good game, he called me back in. He said, you know what, you're right. We're a better team when you pitch. And I went on to pitch my senior year. And I, I, at that time, you know, I was throwing 90, 89, 90. You know, and uh, I was 17. Uh, I had my birthday was in November, and and I like I said, we just played high school ball, and I I just had no idea that I'd get drafted. There was no way. My goal was to help my parents with a baseball scholarship. That was my goal. Now you got to keep in mind, I love playing. I loved playing baseball. I my dad said our garage was so dented up from me throwing balls in the garage, and it would hit the garage and roll back down the driveway. He said it would. It, there must. It looked like Fenway Park. You know, it looked like the Green Monster all dented up. And and uh, you know, I was lucky. I had a great dad. Came home every day at three o'clock. He caught me on the side of the house. He sat on a milk crate. And I think part of the reason I throw I threw strikes at a young age was because I didn't make him go get the ball. You know, because he complained to me. He'd say, "Hey, let's go hit my glove. I don't want to go get the ball. I just worked all day." And there was some added. I, I concentrated more. I did. There was a, there was a there was a goal. You know, and I, I, and I, I really made me focus. And we can go into all that about, even in pro ball, we get on the players about focusing more when they play catch and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, then I get drafted and I go, I, I had a letter, uh, half a scholarship to Western Michigan, and I was on my way. I was going to go to Western Michigan. I had my roommate picked out and everything. Then the draft comes. I come home from the mall, screwing around my buddy, and my dad says, you got drafted in the fifth round. And back then, they only did the first five rounds on day one. So we never thought I'd get drafted. We didn't know. There was, you know, there might have been 10 radar guns when I pitched. And when I played shortstop, there was no, no radar guns. So we didn't know if, we were, if I was going to get drafted. And I ended up getting drafted. And uh, that was the first time I was ever on a plane. I flew to Toronto. Yeah, right? I'd never been on a plane before. Yeah. I, matter of fact, I've, I'd only been to Tiger Stadium one time in my life. And I grew up 30 minutes from the stadium. But we didn't go to the games much. Like I said, I enjoyed playing. I didn't enjoy going to watch. And I think that's why my basketball career ended because I didn't, I didn't like watching anymore, so I had to quit in 10th grade. I got sick of being on the bench. So, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is the message is play multiple sports if you can because football really helped me be a better pitcher. Being the quarterback helped me with my leadership skills. It also helped me be a tougher player on the mound. And I really think that quarterbacking made me a tougher pitcher. So I always try to encourage the kids to play multiple sports. Yeah. Uh, further to that, and then Spolly, you can hop on right after Pat uh, on this question, I guess, is because there are a lot of young players who are told, you know, hey, this is it. You got to focus on this sport. What about today's athlete? And I mean, because there are elite players and they, you know, especially at this time, you're obviously encouraging multi-sports, but what is the what is the dynamic i guess for these players where 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 can they share it because you know you have to play baseball full on you know you don't want to get hurt playing something else and maybe a message to the parents as well i, I like that message i don't think there are enough multi-sport athletes anymore you know it, it's tougher now because we didn't have indoor facilities yeah. you know that's a game changer for the guys in the cold climate you know we couldn't play baseball because it was so cold here in michigan so we couldn't play until we could get outside. I mean, yeah, we had the high school gym if you played for the high school team. But, it, it, you know, it, you couldn't get outside and play. So the indoor facilities, that's been a game changer, I think, for the kids today. Look, I'm not saying you have to play multiple sports. I'm just saying if I had a son, that would be – I would try to encourage him to play multiple sports because I know how much I benefited from playing football. Yeah. Spall? Yeah, it, uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, more exposure you get to different sports, different coaches, different uh, approaches to teaching. Uh, they all become tools to you at some point down the road in your career. You'll remember something somebody said to you and you'll be able to apply it to that situation. And, and hearing the same message over and over again, it's not necessarily the best medicine for you, uh, but 
somebody can say, you know, I could say something to you, uh, Pat could say, give you the same message in a different, uh, in a different delivery, and it clicks with you. And I think having that many, having many different coaches and many different people approaching you and talking to you and, and having baseball or other sports discussions with you, uh, only contributes to your success. I think somebody's uh, not muted. If they can mute in, that would be good. Um, okay, let's have some fun, guys. Um, let's talk about let's talk about mound visits first of all. The best mound visit, funniest mound visit, uh, most frustrating mound visit, whatever it might be. Give me, give us some stuff. What state? What goes on in Zoom stays on in Zoom. So, Pat, you first. Um, two two mound visits come to mind. One was. Uh, Charlie O'Brien, it was in my Cy Young year, my best season I ever had. It was late in the game. It was like the seventh or eighth inning, and um, I was at the end. And Mel Queen came out to the mound, and Charlie came out to the mound. And Mel looked at me and said, how do you feel? And I said, I feel good. I feel good. I'm fine. I get this guy. And Charlie says, he has nothing. He is done. He's throwing slop right now. You got to come get him right now. And Mel looked at me, looked at Charlie. He said, uh, he, goes, he goes, okay, can you get me one more guy? I, got, I, got, I think I got Quantrill coming up and behind you. And I remember the, that night we got in the shower, and I was like, Charlie, he's like, Pat, it's honest, good feedback. I'm like, I hear you, brother. I hear you. <laughs> um, but there's many episodes like that. The other one was a cool one was uh, we were playing in Milwaukee, and I was with the Cardinals, and McGuire was our first baseman, Mark McGuire. And he, didn't, he never made mound visits. And Methaney didn't make much mound visits either. Mike was my catcher. And uh, the game was on the line. I was, I, I was winning two to one or losing two to one. It was like sixth inning. I had second and third. I had the bottom of the order coming up. I, I kind of hesitated. I looked over at the guy on deck. And I'm let, playing the lineup in my head. I'm thinking, who's in the hole? And I'm thinking, do I want to go after this guy? I knew the pitcher was two spots away, so I couldn't get to him. And all this is going on within like a five, eight second, you know, mindset, right? And I, I, I'm looking, I, I turn around, I look, and McGuire's standing on the rubber. And I said, I said, hey, Sack. And everybody called him Sack. And it wasn't for his ball sack. It was for his first sack, for playing first base. And I said, Sack, I go, I go, uh, I go what are you doing out here? And he looks at me and he goes, he goes, hey, man. He goes, what would you have for lunch today? And I said, I had a club sandwich. He goes, where? I said, at the hotel. And he goes, what would you get to drink? I said, I had a Diet Coke. He goes, all right, man, let's get this guy. Come on. <laughs> so, you know, he's playing the mind game, you know. It's the red panty theory. You know, it's a, it, it distracted me of the, of, the, of the exact moment. It took me out of that moment and then, um, you know, makes you rethink and reconcentrate and focus. So that's probably the two that, step, that come to my mind. Spally? Well, uh, maybe, Pat, you can help me out here. I don't remember whether it was your 19th or 20th win we were in Baltimore, and I came in in a – pretty tight situation runners on and um, meat of the order coming up and back then the uh, the old O's they could hit a little bit and uh, Charlie O'Brien you know Cito leaves the mound and uh, and Pat's out of the game and uh, Charlie comes up to me after Cito leaves and he goes you nervous I'm like well you know tough spot I really want to get these you know get through this lineup here and I got three lefties coming up I want to get through them and he turns around and walks, uh, walks back to the behind the plate, sits down, and flips me off. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so kind of, you know, again, it's one of those things where it breaks your concentration and forces you to get back and uh, get your line of thinking right. And I was like, oh, okay. And, uh, and uh, again, another one that, uh, that uh, was with Charlie again. Uh, we were, I remember we were in Toronto, and I don't remember the circumstances. And uh, he asked me, who are you, uh, how do you want to get this guy? And I go, well, the book is, you know, whatever. And he goes, that ain't working today. I'm like, okay, so what do you want to go with? He goes, just throw it. I'm like, what do you mean? Just, what am I throwing? Like, give me a first pitch and I can go off of, you know? He's like, just throw it. And he gets behind the dish and just gives me one of these. Yeah, I'm like, you know, he, then I call time, he comes out and he goes, you don't throw hard enough to hurt me anyway, so don't worry about it, just throw it. I'm like, all right, no problem. So, of course, I rear back and try to throw my hardest fastball ever, and of course, he catches it like it was, you know, catching a, a, a snowball, it was nothing for him. So, you know, he was, he was great at, uh, at doing those sorts of things. He was, uh, he had an extraordinary ability to take balls that were just off the plate, make them look like strikes, and he, he was just a great catcher, and he was a lot of fun to have as a teammate, too. Uh, fun is 
the name of the game. I mean, you guys must have had some great laughs. One thing about baseball with 162 and you're in a clubhouse every day and you're with so many different players and teammates. Spolly, I'll start with you this time. Pat, you can follow. The best pranks or the, the funniest moments uh, or the funny moment that you remember that you'll never, ever forget. Your go-to baseball funny story because this game is full of funny stories. Honestly, Rod, I don't have one that is particularly that really stands out in my mind. I think back and I look at my career and the people that I was fortunate enough to play with and how many jokesters I ran across and some of the things that went on. No I hot mean, feet? It, uh, oh, of course there was hot feet. And, you know, I, I had this one pitching coach when I was in Myrtle Beach. His name was Darren Balsley. He was a big league pitching coach for the Padres forever. And he had uh, OCD, like – to the nth degree. He had it so bad that if you took chalk from the line and spread it along from the first baseline towards the bullpen, he would not go to the bullpen. He wouldn't cross any line. And uh, we used to set gum traps for him, you know, just chew up a bunch of gum and throw it out and, and make a, anything that was in a line, he wouldn't do. Uh, I remember, you know, just watching him getting dressed and he would have, you know, everything had to go on and off three times, He'd put his socks on three times, off three times, He'd belt around him on and off three times. It was just, it was crazy stuff. And he used to be at this uh, Ford Pro, if you remember those things, he swore it was faster than any NASCAR ever. And he just, you know, just so many good characters that we were, you know, we were both, both Pat and I were very fortunate enough to be around and, uh, you know, but. I really couldn't pick just one moment that is just one of those moments that you just constantly reflect on and laugh because there was too many of them. Yeah. There, was, there was always a good time. Pat? Yeah, he's right. It is hard. I mean, I tried to enjoy myself. I know the first few years when you're trying to get established, you're, you don't have as much fun because you're grinding and you're trying to perform. And then once you get established and you have some confidence, you start to really enjoy the time. Uh, and it, it goes by really, really fast. But, um, you know, a few things, like Turner Ward was a funny teammate. You know, mm. he guy that, uh, you know, he'd do the dollar bill on the dental floss at the airport, then go up to hug the guy after the guy get pissed, and he'd go up and hug him and say, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, he, we'd be on the bus, and he'd get, he'd get the whole bus to say, um, he'd get the whole bus to do this. Boom, 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 ba -da -doom, boom, 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 ba -da -doom, boom. And then he'd sing Vanilla Ice, uh, whatever song, I, you know, stop. Ice, clap. ice, baby. Ice, ice, baby. Yeah. And the whole bus would go crazy. Uh, McGuire was a funny guy. Mark McGuire was a great teammate, really great superstar teammate, very down to earth. I could see why Larusa, when he left Oakland, he, he brought McGuire with him to St. Louis. He was a really special player for me. Um, yeah, there was a lot of characters, man. Charlie O'Brien was a character. Sean Green was a great character. Sean Green was very talented. He'd impersonate people. He could do Jim Carrey like it was just Jim Carrey. Because Dumb and Dumber was a popular movie back then. and. Um, Alex Gonzalez was funny. I mean, so many good teammates. I, you know, Spully's right. It's hard to just pick out a story and just have, yeah, let me just give you this one. But um, many stories of just having fun in the whirlpool, having fun in the training room, uh, flat ground work. You know, everybody's having fun. And, and I heard Derek Jeter say this, and I love Jeter. I, I think Jeter's a great player and a great role model, or he was a great player. But I remember I read a quote by him, and he said, that, you know, you have to continue to have fun. No matter how much you're grinding, and no matter how many people you think are watching and no matter how bad or how low you get, continue to have fun. Because Derek Jeter, the way he put it, it was like he's still having as much fun in his 15th year in the big leagues as he was when he was 15 playing in uh, federation ball or travel ball. So, yeah, it's hard to come up with some stories. I'll tell you what, as we're going on, if I think of one, I'll, I'll throw it out there. Okay, let's go this way. I, I, got, I got one. That well, I go ahead, Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I was in Seattle, uh, Junior and I got along exceptionally well, and uh, so we used to sit in our lockers and play Nintendo, and he would be Junior, and I'd be me, and I, we'd face each other, and uh, I had some pretty decent numbers against uh, Junior. I don't, I, he maybe got a hit off of me, but I really don't even remember it too well, to be honest with you, if he did get one, but uh, yeah. So we come in one day, and we're, everybody's goofing around, and, and Randy Johnson and uh, David Segui, who at the time was probably all hopped up on uh, steroids, was going crazy, and they were fighting, arguing, having a good time carrying on, and Junior jumped me and started to, to just go to town on me. And I'm like, wait a minute here, Junior, listen, this is only going to end in one of two ways. Me going home 
or you getting hurt. And they both end with me going home. So let's not go there and let's just stop this right now. So yeah, we, we used to have a lot of fun in that Mariner clubhouse. It was, it was a pretty rambunctious bunch, I'll say that. There was a lot of broken walls and lockers and all sorts of stuff in there, that's for sure. You know, I, I remember one time Junior was having a particularly rough string of uh, at-bats and uh, he came flying into the, uh, through the dugout, you had to go through, through the dugout into this open area that had a wall that was probably, you know, 30 feet long and had a, like a 12 or 14 foot high mirror on it. And between him and Buner, that those mirrors didn't last much more than a week. And one particular day, Junior had uh, had I don't know whether it was a golden sombrero or whatever, but he came into the clubhouse and shredded a bat box where everybody comes in and puts their bats at the end of the game. It looked like it had been put through a meat grinder. It was n the biggest piece was a toothpick size shred. It was unbelievable how he devastated this thing, and then walks out with a smile. Like, what is going on? <laughs> yeah. That's the game. Uh, there's no doubt Ken Griffey Jr., you know, certainly one of the top 10 greatest players of all time. I mean, numbers, everything, you could certainly put him up there. So I want to go now, let's, let's, let's talk about some reflections for both of you. Pat, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the toughest, well, not here, let's go this way. The greatest player that you've ever seen play. Uh, play against or play with? How about both? Uh, playing with, I mean, look, I was lucky to play with Winfield, Alomar, Molitor, and Henderson. So four Hall of Famers that you can argue all four, you know, Winfield, Henderson, Alomar, I mean, wow. If I had to pick, I'd say Ricky. I mean, Ricky was an absolute game changer on the base paths. He was an underrated defender. His confidence, I got to play with him. It, it just made everybody in our locker room be more confident. It did. It absolutely did. And, um, he, yeah, I would say Ricky Henderson as far as who I played with. The greatest player that I played against, probably Junior. I thought Junior was the best all-around player. You know, when you add in power and, and speed. I mean, the guy could have stole 30 bases. I think he just chose not to run um, just to save his body. But to look at what Ricky did in a 25-year career is really remarkable. I remember a quick funny story about Ricky. We were on the bus together, and I said, I said, hey, Ricky, did you play high school football? And I didn't look on my phone or anything. I didn't even – should we even have phones back then? What am I thinking? And um, I said, Ricky, I said, you play football. And I figured he did. He said, running back. And I said, I said, yes, it's scholarship. And he looked at me kind of like, what are you, nuts, man? He said, I could have went anywhere I wanted in the country. That's, <laughs> yeah. And I remember just sitting there in the, on the bus just going, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I'm year two. He's in year, like, 16 or whatever he was. So, yeah, yeah, Ricky Henderson for me. Alomar was great. You know, at one point, I think Robbie in Toronto, if you were to do a mock draft, he would have been probably the first player taken in the MLB as far as all around. Because when we lost Devon White and Roberto Alomar in the same offseason, I had 10 pitchers calling me, crying. We were all crying. We are like, what are we doing, man? What are the Jays doing? You know, like, well, how are we going to lose two gold glovers up the middle like that in the same offseason? So, yeah, I would say Ricky for me. Ricky and Griffey was the best I thought in the league, but Ricky was the best I played with. Small? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was fortunate. I got to uh, play with some pretty good players in, uh, through my career, but uh, I, would, I would have the same sentiment as, uh, as Pat, is that uh, it would either be Junior or A-Rod. Um, both those players are just unbelievable, like truly. Uh, you don't really get to appreciate how good they are until you play with them or see them play every single day, and their, their, their peaks and valleys did not exist. They, they only existed within the game. Uh, I was upset, one at bat, I'm ready for the next pitch, uh, it's over, I'm on to the next thing. Uh, they, were, they were just truly remarkable as far as their, their just God-given ability and how they handled themselves on a daily basis with people, with teammates and, and media. Like, I mean, they were scrutinized over everything. They, um, yeah, I, I, they were just remarkable to watch every single day. Um, you guys, uh, unlike many of us mere mortals, you guys had a chance to, to, to play in the show. What is the coolest thing, when you look back on it, about being a big leaguer? Pat? Uh, World Series for me. Yeah, yeah, just being lucky to be on a team. I mean, like I said, I played with Winfield. He had been in the league all those years, didn't have a ring. We got the ring in 92. Then he leaves free agency. We get Molitor, played all those years in the big leagues without a ring. And we got a ring for him, too. 
And here I'm my first two years in the big leagues, I got two rings. So, you know, and didn't have half the career those guys had. And I think that's probably the biggest thing is just being so fortunate to be healthy, blessed, the opportunity. But on top of that, to be surrounded by an incredible squad to win back-to-back -back World Series uh, with, I think, only 15 players that were on both teams. So we had some turnover. It wasn't like it was the same 25 guys. And um, that, that's probably it for me. The World Series was something else. Can I real touch real quick about best player ever? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned uh, – Paul mentioned about the quality of the players and how they handle themselves. That's something that I'm glad you brought that up because that's one of the things I noticed about Ricky, Robbie, Olerud, Molitor. It was their routine. It was their, it was their work habits. These guys were off the charts, man. Molitor was the first guy in our organization to come to Toronto as a free agent, sell his house in Milwaukee, rent a place in Toronto, work out all winter at the Dome. That was unheard of back. You know, I went back to Detroit. Carter went back to Kansas City. Alomar went to Puerto Rico. I mean, this guy decided I'm going to commit myself to the city of Toronto. I signed a three-year deal. He moved his family there, and he worked out. And, boy, you can tell. Let me tell you, these guys at 40 years old, when they took their shirts off, they looked like they were the ones that were 23. And, and you know, yeah, I don't know about steroids. I don't know about Mahler doing I don't know about any of those guys doing it back then. But I will say this. Their work habits were good. They were consistent, and they were really good workers, all of them. Smalley? Um, I think just, you know, the realization of a dream. Um, you know, when, when you keep setting your goals and you keep attaining them and you keep moving that goal line further back and further back and you test yourself and you test your resolve and you test your will and you get to that goal and it's somehow it's not good enough anymore. Now I want to be an all-star. Now I want to be a Cy Young. Now I want to be the, the top reliever. You just, I think the, the, the desire to constantly improve and not be afraid of, to put in the work to get to that point is, is probably the best advice that I could give anybody is that the goal doesn't end. Getting to the big leagues, yes, it's difficult, but it's harder to stay. It is very, very hard to stay. It's a puppy mill. You, you, may, you know, if you don't start, if you stop producing, the next guy in line who's making less money who can do the same thing, can come in and do it. And that's the way, you know, it's a turnover. And it, it, it's, it, it's really hard, uh, you know, to, to let go of it all when that, when that time comes too at the same time. It's, it's very difficult to let go of it and realize that, you know, maybe the game's passed me by. Yeah, yeah that's, those are great words of advice. And I encourage all the players out there to get your notepads ready because we're going to ask you guys some, some, some good pieces of advice for not only the players – but the coaches and the parents out there in a moment. But I guess the journalistic side of me wants to talk about this. Um, before the pandemic, the biggest story in baseball was sign stealing. I want to ask both of you what you thought of it. Um, had you seen anything like that before? Uh, and what was your entire take on it? I guess, Pat, you can go first. Yeah, you know, sign stealing has been part of the game for a long time. You know, we, had, we stole signs all the time, but we didn't use technology. And I think that's where everybody's really sour about it is the fact that all the clubs were warned to not use technology, and Houston went ahead and did that as well. So, I don't know. I think the players are pretty upset about it. I know that. I think that, um, you know, I think Cal Ripken said it best not too long ago. He came out and said we can end that by calling the slider down and away and throwing the ball up and in. I mean, that's how we handled it back then. Mm -hmm. The players policed themselves a little bit uh, more so than they do now. Um, you know, for instance, Molitor would be batting. Joe would get the signs, and Joe would lead off with his feet one inning. Then he'd come in after that half inning and say, hey, it was feet last inning. Let's go hands this inning. So what he's telling you is he's moving his hand, showing you what side of the plate it's on. And I remember Molitor saying, I don't want to know unless you're 100%. I don't want to know. Are you 100%? So that stuff's been going on for a long time. I think the biggest thing with Houston is they're using the video replay and on real time, like what Boston did with uh, Pedroia, with the, with the Apple Watch. Um, but we've been doing – baseball's been doing that forever. First base coach can lean in a little close to the – you know, pick up the signs by the catcher because he's got his right leg wide open. So there's multiple ways of doing it. I think that if you let the players police it, I don't think – I think you'd have less trouble if you just let the players police it. That's my own opinion. Keep technology away as well. Keep the cameras away. I mean, again, like you say, it's been going on. You know, guys look for tip, tips, et cetera. Spally, what were your thoughts when, you know, the Astros went, you know, 
they, they went modern day with this technology. Yeah, I was I, I was disappointed in in that they use technology. Like you know, I'm a, I'm an old school baseball kind of guy where you know what if you're going to steal signs, do it the hard, do it the right way, earn them. You know, if you can pick them off by by other people's ignorance, that's that's acceptable to me. Uh, now you know a good, you know to go towards uh, policing ourselves. I I just don't think today's game does that. I, I don't know whether it's the players are are softer or just don't care like we used to care. I, I don't know. I don't have that answer. But, um, you know, if you're stealing signs, you're stealing signs. Be prepared to get thrown at. It's, mm -hmm. it's keep in mind, yeah, keep in mind, too, like when I played in the mid-'90s, Clemens and I, we had multiple signs with nobody on because we were worried about them stealing our signs from the center field camera, you know. So you play Minnesota on Monday, and then five days later you got to pitch against Minnesota, you're going with a whole new set of signs because they're watching the game that you just pitched from the center field camera, they're seeing everything. I mean, there were games when I went two was my fastball, four was my fastball, three was my fastball. I changed my signs all the time with the runner on second. This was nobody on, I was changing my signs. We were constantly doing that. And I always, got, I always thought that the relievers made it too simple for themselves. You know, they would always come in and just say, follow the two or second sign. And, but they're not out there enough to get exposed. They only go through the lineup once, and that's a three inning reliever. So. I think as a starting pitcher, we were very aware of teams stealing our signs. That's been going on forever. And the rule of thumb was if you're dumb enough to let it happen, oh, well, it's not cheating. That's the way MLB looked at it from a player's standpoint. If you can't figure out how to get a better set of signs, then shame on you. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you both. You're, you're not only bonded by the fact you were teammates, you're big leaguers, uh, and you're great friends, but you were also great friends with Roy Halladay. What did Doc – mean to both of you um and, you know we saw the great documentary um and the bravery of his wife um i guess it was about a week ago that came on uh, he's a hall of famer quite obviously he was a tremendous pitcher but i know both of you were very close to roy holiday w what did he and his legacy mean to you well i'll, I'll start because uh, pat spent more time with him in the at the major league level than i did i i was fortunate enough to come up with roy uh, through the minor leagues. Uh, I got to the big leagues before him, but, um, you know, he, there was a guy, you want to talk about work. Holy moly. This guy put in the hours, like nonstop hours and uh, his dedication and his, his, you know, his will to keep learning and not be satisfied with, with being good. It was that being good. Wasn't good enough. I wanted to be excellent. And uh, uh, you know, he, he put in the work to do it. And uh, you know, People like that are rare, and, and it shows. I mean, it just – you go through the, the history books of baseball, and you can, you can almost unilaterally pick out – every Hall of Famer does the same amount of work. You know, they, they – it, it's not that my work is any less. They just put in that extra effort that maybe, you know, I didn't know about or Pat didn't know about, but they just – they found different ways to make themselves better. Pat? Yeah, I mean, Doc is uh, – Doc was a guy that you didn't need to watch him work out. You didn't need to monitor You know, you always say – Kids, it's easy to do 10 pulls and do a bunch of push-ups and sit-ups when the coach is watching you. But what, when he's not watching you, are you cheating? Because if you are, you're cheating yourself, right? Doc wasn't that way. Doc was an incredibly hard worker. Saw him come up through the minor leagues. We all knew him and Carpenter. We used to call him the Twin Towers. You know, these two guys were in AAA, and they're bigger, stronger, and throw harder than the guys that we had in the rotation in Toronto at the time. We knew they were coming up. It was a matter of not if they were coming, it was when. And, uh, you know, I still to this day think Doc would have been fine if he just stayed over the top. I don't think he necessarily had to go down low and, and lower his arm slot. I think he'd have figured it out because he was so good. Um, and, uh, you know, good teammate, really good, really good uh, mental game. He was very tough. He, he credited a lot of his success to Harvey Dorfman, the book, uh, Pitching Mentality, ABC. Uh, yeah. So he loved that book. He, he talked about that book a lot. Um, and, you know, his, his routine was just so regimented. He, he just would not miss running. He would not miss the throwing part. He would be sore and still do it. And he just trusted that process. I heard he was, like, down to the minute. Like, I remember you, you never talked to him game day. You'd see him, he'd go, like, everything was is, – is, was he that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I used to – we all did that. If the game was at 707, you, you went to the bullpen at 643 because you knew you needed 17 minutes to do your routine. You needed four or five minutes to get back to the dugout. The anthem is going to delay it. So the players, there's more guys that do that than you think. But Doc took it to the next level. And, you know, just the, the, the video time that he put in on, on studying the hitters, 
Uh, his side sessions were just incredible. Listen, kids, and you're not even kids. You guys are young men. Listen, you need to learn how to practice. The better you can become a practice player, the better you will be. You need to self-coach. Don't forget these things. This is why I made it to the big leagues. This is why Doc made it to the Paul. We could self-coach. If you can't self-coach, you're done. You can't be relying on somebody else. I'm on the mound all by myself. And if you can't feel where the ball went and feel that, then you need to practice harder and you need to pay more attention when you're throwing your sides. Because no matter where that ball goes, it tells you what you did mechanically. And speaking of mechanics, don't use it as an excuse. If you have a bad game, it's a bad game. Mike Trout has bad games. Ken Griffey Jr. has bad games. Verlander has bad games. Garrett Cole has bad games. I mean, come on. Don't use your mechanics as an excuse. Your mechanics are what they are on that given day. Go out and compete your butt off. Be the best competitor on the field. Not necessarily, oh, my mechanics. Or, you know, look, I'm in player development. I see it all the time in AAA. I see guys, they don't want to be out there. I can tell. They look into the dugout. They look down to the bullpen. They go to grab the rosin bag. They peek up to see what the guy's warming up in the bullpen. You know what? Doc Halliday didn't do that. He didn't do that when he was in AAA. Doc Halliday didn't do that in the big leagues when he was thrown over the top and he almost had a no-hitter in the ninth. It's about perseverance and grit and toughness. And, and you know, um, just all these things that Doc brought to the table. On top of that, he was a good teammate. And let me tell you one more thing about playing catch with Doc Halliday. Every day I played catch with Doc, we played 21. Sounds stupid, doesn't it? Roy Halliday in 2004 is playing 21 with me at the end of my career. You know what that is? Two points for the head, one point for the chest. First guy to get to 21 wins. Why did we do this? Every day we did this. You know why? Because it makes you practice here. You can't just be airheaded all day for four straight days, and then all of a sudden the game starts and you're going to lock it in. I only played with one guy that could do that. His name was David Wells, the only guy I ever played with that could do that. Literally didn't have to do a whole lot off the field. Didn't have to do a lot of exercising. He was that gifted. He played 20 seasons and won 250 games. You know, this guy didn't, you know, he could have kept himself in better shape. Maybe he wouldn't have pitched as well. I don't know. My point is that Doc Halliday was a great practice player. Become a great practice player. You will be a better player on the field. Oh, that, that, those are just great words. Man, I, I want to play for you. You, you know, man, you get me fired up. Um, you both now are also, you know, you, you're leaders now. Your mentors, your coaches. Um, you, you, the game has been played for a century and, and more. Still nine innings, still nine players. You know, you could talk about DHs and all that other stuff. In today's game, the best piece of advice that both of you can give to these young players who are watching and listening tonight. Um, for the pitchers, fastball command. Don't, don't always try to throw the ball so hard. I know you got to get recognized. I get that. But, man, I can't tell you, five years in the minor leagues, I've buckshot in my fastball in there so much. I walked 90 guys in A-ball, 90. 90 guys in 150 innings in A-ball, and I became a control pitcher. So don't tell me it can't happen. Don't tell me you can't do it. Nothing changed with my mechanics. It was all my mindset. It was all how I challenged myself. It was all becoming a better practice player. It was taking accountability. Don't blame it on the other guy. Always making excuses. And if you're a hitter, you know, I wasn't a good enough hitter. I, I, batted, I was a good hitter in high school, but in pro ball, they took the bat away from me the year I got drafted, and I didn't get to pick it back up until 14 years later when they had interleague play. As, as a hitter, for me, it's about competing. It's about barreling the ball. Your results are, it is what it is, man. You hit a line drive right at somebody, hang with them. Then you chop a ball, dribble stump, and you get a 30-foot single. You know, I remember asking managers this, how many at-bats does it take with a pitcher before you count a matchup, a real matchup? He said eight. I said, eight at-bats. He's like, yep. He's like, so if he's four for eight off me, he rakes me. He goes, that's right, he hits you good, 500. I said, what about if three were bloopers and one was a C&I broken back grounder right in front of the shortstop? I said, shouldn't we check exit below against as opposed to uh, four for eight? You know, now keep in mind, they didn't even have exit below when I played. <laughs> But you know what? This wasn't when I played. This was when I was a bullpen coach, and they mm -hmm. did have, and they did have exit velo. And uh, trust me, as a pitcher, when I played in my era, you knew who had exit velo. You didn't need a radar gun to tell you. I could tell you when Delgado was 16, he had exit velo, because we could all turn our backs on the field back then in Dunedin, and you could just tell by the sound it was Delgado. And you know, and then he went on to do exactly what he did. You know, have a great career. But uh, go ahead, Spill. I got a little long-winded. That That's great. all right, Mo. That was, that was a good word. Now, we know, sure. now you know why we called him Bulldog. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, for me, I think it's, it's a very simple thing. I think you have to believe in yourself. You have to believe in everything that you've done to get you to where you are is all the right reasons. And if you start doubting now, doubt's the killer. Um, you, you just can't doubt will simply end everything for you. Uh, you got to lie to yourself. You got to cheat yourself. You got to figure out ways to make yourself believe and be confident in yourself and your abilities. Because at the end of the day, if you have none of that, it doesn't matter what kind of stuff you got. Those hitters smell blood and they want it. And, you know, to touch on hitting, I think I, I couldn't agree more with Pat, man. Uh, you know, the results are often out of your control. Uh, you know, squaring up a ball is all you can do. And, uh, and I think that should be your main goal is, is hitting ball hard somewhere. Uh, last one for me, and I think a couple of coaches might come on. I know we're running out of time. Um, the balance that both of you had to achieve, not only through baseball, but the rest of your life, where baseball's not all consuming. I mean, we have lives as well. Did you have a tough time with it? What, what kind of advice would you give to these young players who are also getting, um, you know, the, the, the golden goal is to, to get an education as well through this. What would be your best piece of advice, Spala, you can start on balance, especially at this age? Uh, I, I, it's best to develop a routine. You know, whatever your plan is, don't deviate from it. You know, allot yourself a certain time for school, for your homework, for your practices, downtime for you, away from your teammates, away from everybody, just so that you can gather your thoughts and clear your head. Um, you know, having that routine to me was, was fundamental to my successes. Uh, um, I knew what time I needed to leave for the ballpark. I knew what time I needed to have lunch. I knew what time I needed to be on the field. And there was never any doubts. It, was, it, it became so entrenched and ingrained in me that it became automatic. Pat? Yeah, I think the biggest thing, too, is you know, like Spally said, is a routine and all that. Can you repeat the question one more time? Just the balance that you had to have and, and, yeah. and the advice you would give maybe even through you know, some of your trials and tribulations as a young ball player, maybe something you might have done differently or maybe some advice you might have for these, these young ball players as they are embarking on this journey. I mean, so many more distractions than when I was your age. That's one, first of all. You have to learn how to balance your distractions and prioritize what's important, okay? Like I tell my kids all the time, God, family, school, it, okay? You can, you can, that's just what I tell my kids. And you live by that and you're good. Okay, and then when you get older, it's God, family, work. And if you don't want to put God in there, that's your own prep. That's your own, you know, then do it the way you want to do it. But you got to learn how to prioritize your goals. You have to learn how to block out the distractions. And uh, you have to want it. I'm telling you right now, my garage door was dinged up like you wouldn't believe. That's wanting it, you know, at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, playing every day, all the time, as much as I can when the weather permitted. Um, and, you know, I, I, I just think that there's so many distractions right now. The kids, have, they have a tougher time challenging. It's more challenging in this era, for sure. Social media is incredible right now. And um, I just joined Twitter and Facebook. How about that? Good laughs on the whole Zoom thing with 100-plus people laughing at me. Um, pretty sad, right? But uh, I could see how it's addictive and there's a lot of distractions. So prioritize what's important to you in your life. Prioritize your schoolwork, your parents. Be a good person to your parents. I mean, all those things, man. It's common sense stuff, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Now those, again, wise words. I can see why both of you guys uh, not only became great big leaguers, um, but, you know, became great community guys, too. And, and I can see why you have become friends through the years. So that's it for me. I know Zinger is on, and I think a couple of coaches might have some questions, I, or some, some players may have actually texted in. But uh, thanks, you guys. You're awesome. I appreciate it. Those are great pieces of advice. Great pieces of advice. Yeah, Han, I got some questions. Do you yeah. want me to just weave in the player questions as well? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, uh, Pat, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Jordan. Um, I'll just get to a player question first that came in. Um, what mindset did you have when you when you were on the mound, or what sort of philosophy would you recommend to these kids? Okay, first five and a half years, hope mode. Then I got that aha moment with Mark Icorn. I started believing in myself. Next thing you know, the results started happening. My mindset was what Paul touched on earlier. You have to trick yourself on that day. It made me think of a story because I used to spend a lot of time with Jack Morris, who just went in the Hall of Fame, and I grew up in Detroit. He told me, uh, he said, you pitch as hard as you can, as long as you can, until the manager comes to get you. And you have that mindset. And he told me, he said, and this was in the sauna after BP in Toronto. We used to go in there after batting practice and talk shop. And he told me, he said, you have to be the best competitor, and you outlast the other starting pitcher. You'll win more games. And, and – um, 
I think my mindset was aggressiveness, but it was not always like that. And I had to teach myself how to do that on the fifth day. So four out of five days, you're happy, go lucky. And then on the fifth day, all of a sudden you got to put this game face on and be somebody that you're not. Okay. That's what I did. I did that. I became somebody that I wasn't on my game day. All right. And maybe I have shades of that personality and it doesn't come out as much, but on my fifth day, my mindset was be aggressive, go at people, go as hard as you can, because really in the end, uh, you can't control a lot of the results anyway. It's all about the next pitch. It's all about what's out in front of you, not behind you. Awesome. Um, Paul and Pat, I want you to kind of chime in on this next piece too, because uh, this alludes into what Pat just mentioned. Um, the mindset of like, you got to kind of pry me off the mound. Like you, you want to outcompete the other pitcher. Pitch counts. Where are you at on that sort of subject? I mean, we're inundated with them now um, from seven years old all the way through high school. Um, I know they're there for a purpose. Are you a fan of them? Do you think they're holding kids back from competing late in the games? I just want your thoughts on that. Uh, amateur game? No. For me, I think pitch counts are great. Especially now kids play longer seasons. They play year-round. I mean, if you don't have pitch counts, these kids will have surgery by the time they're 18. So for me, you know, remember in my era, we played multiple sports. I only played baseball during baseball season. Then all my gear got put away, and then I played football and then basketball. So now these kids are playing indoors year-round and playing so much. I think pitch count's pretty valuable, actually, and I like it. Yep. Paul, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, no, I, I, I totally agree with that. I, I think the um, – uh, as far as the big league level goes, uh, you know, there's a big difference uh, between 100 pitches, one nothing game, and 100 pitches in a 10 nothing game. Uh, I think coaches need to, to uh, show some common sense that, you know, yeah, we want to win the game, but, you know, uh, 100 pitches under a one nothing game is a whole heck of a lot more stressful than it is when it's 10 nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can ride a player out and let them, you know, try to go for the win or a complete game or whatever the, that situation is. But yeah, pitch, pitch counts imperative at the, at the amateur level for sure. Awesome. Uh, there's, I think, two or three more player questions here. Um, what would you guys say is the biggest difference in pitching between when you played and now as in the coaching role? Um, I think we were actually talk, talking about it is the pitch count. See, what's happened is analytics has shown that pitchers don't do well third time through the lineup. So a lot of times the numbers are pushing the pitcher off the mound, not so much the pitch count. I think that, and I could vouch, trust me, I started for 13 out of the 14 years and, and uh, I was just as sore at 80 as I was at 115. You know, it didn't matter if I threw 80 pitches over five or, or 115 pitches over seven. Trust me, I was just as sore. And um, so I, I don't know. I, I don't really think there's that much difference except for the fact that they get starting pitchers out sooner just because of the statistics show that you don't do very well third time through. Okay. Um, this one's, I guess, uh, from me on my end. Um, Pat, you mentioned in high school, uh, you were a shortstop basically until your senior year, right? Um, I just want you to kind of allude to both your experience and now on the player development side, a lot of these players feel like, you know, I got to peak at 18. I got to, I got to get to my sort of senior year where, Correct me if I'm wrong, but there is so much more development to come in those years after when they're in college, when they're in pro ball, all those sorts of things, especially when, like you said, you said you were shortstop and arguably the greatest arm in the league right now, DeGrom, was shortstop coming out of college. And you have Stroman, who was the shortstop for Duke, and Harper was throwing 97 as a high school player. Can you just allude to the sort of the development after their, their grade 12 year? Yeah, great question. Um, so the guy, uh, the big guy with the Mets, Syndergaard, we drafted Syndergaard, okay? I saw him and Aaron Sanchez in Lansing when they were like 18, 19. They both threw 91, 92, 93, you know? They'd occasionally hit a little higher spike number, but they didn't pitch any faster than that. They were 91, 92, 93. Big frames, loose arms. Um, Sanchez could spin the crap out of the ball. Syndergaard couldn't, you know? So now, you know, what happens? Uh, we have a chance to get R.A. Dickey. And Sanchez or Syndergaard's got to go to the Mets. we got to make a decision. Well, our front office and all of us collaborated and decided that Sanchez spun the heck out of the ball. Syndergaard didn't. And uh, here, I'm getting to my point. Syndergaard goes to the Mets. Well, we didn't realize, you know, five years later, this guy's going to be throwing 100, you know, and Sanchez is going to throw 97, 98 with, uh, with an ERA title in Toronto. So my point is this. They're much different players five years after high school. 
Now, we saw the projection. Our scouts did a great job drafting these two kids. But they were only throwing 90-91 in high school. They were not throwing 98-99 like what you're seeing on TV now. So there's so much development that takes place physically from 16 to 24. Just a tremendous amount. You have, you have nothing. You should just always try to constantly get better. Constantly get better every day. Self-coach. Awesome. I think um, I'm glad you brought that up just because, again, I think there's not only big league level, like big league examples, but also like you're seeing it now even in Ontario and Canada, like kids are developing at their own paces. It's not like they're just chasing uh, and comparing them to themselves to other kids. Um, Every, everybody's yeah. path is different. Exactly. Um, this is one final question I think we had, we had from the players. Um, what exercises did you guys do to take care of your arms in between outings? Well, for me, I, uh, I did uh, cuff weights almost ex exclusively. I, uh, I didn't really even do tubing. I, I didn't feel like it was beneficial to me. It, it made my arm burn and, and being a reliever, um, I didn't want to go into a game and and have some aches and pains that I that weren't normal uh, due to exercise. So I, I stuck with rotator cuff exercises and and uh, and maintained my strength that way. And I, plus, I did a lot of cardio and, and that sort of stuff, biking, running, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah we definitely trained differently than the pitchers trained today. That's for sure. Um, but I did a lot of rotator cuff exercises during the off season. I did a lot of tubing during the season. Um, I threw thirty five starts. I threw thirty five sides. I didn't like missing my side. I thought it was important, even if I felt kind of cruddy. Um, another key one is warm up the pitch, don't pitch to warm up. There's a big difference. And, and as my routine got better and better, and I got older and older, I realized how much more I had to warm up to get ready. So I'd throw my side, I'd spend, you got 13 minutes to throw a side, 35 pitch side, I'd spend the first 20 getting loose. I said, what good is that? And then I started to realize, and this is probably my first year, second year in the big leagues, uh, how important it was to get loose before I pitched. So basically, I always try to tell the kids, you warm up to pitch, don't pitch to warm up. It was a big difference. And, 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 uh, um, so, and, and then we did a lot of tubing. Um, we did a lot of rotator cuff stuff and a lot of running. We were like track stars back then. We ran a lot. You know, that's just how we trained back then. Awesome. Um, Honor, do you got anything you want to add? I got, I got a question. Yeah, Kemal, go ahead. For Pat, I might be way off base with this, but – I recall growing up, did you have a pretty good third to first move? <laughs> How disappointed were you when they banged that? Because I remember growing up and we do third to first, and I'm like, boom, you got Hankton right there. Yeah, I know. You know what? It, it looks like um, I, I practiced that move. I really did practice that move. One year, I think I got like four or five guys. My yeah. proudest moment on my third to first move was I got Molitor after we were teammates. So he <laughs> helped me do that, that sloppy move for three years. And then he went to Minnesota, and I got him, and I was so shocked. I picked my foot up. I spaked the third. I looked over, and he was, he was looking at home. I was <laughs> laughing. And so was Joe Carter. I'm yelling at Joe because I'm yelling, Joe, Joe. Joe and Molitor are both looking at home, waiting for the ball to get there. So I love doing that move. Hey, man, an ounce and out. Yeah. You know, being a good fielding pitcher. There's no reason to not be a good fielding pitcher. You should be good at that if you're not practice more. Because that's an out, an ounce and out. You only need 27. So third to first, man, get yourself out of a jam. I used to run the daylight all the time at second base. I'll tell you what, I just talked to Charlie O'Brien about a month ago. And I threw 265 innings, only 12 guys tried to steal. In wow. 265 innings. And it wasn't because I was fast to the plate. And it wasn't because I had a third to first move. It was all because I set, changed my times, slide step, that kind of stuff. All those little things that can help your game be a better pitcher, be a better player. Again, it gets back to self-coaching, man. Talk to, talk to each other. Talk to your teammates. Cool. Very cool. Hey, Zinger, do you want to show that uh, – before we let these guys go, do yeah. you want to show um, that video of uh, Pat on the ceremonial pitch coming back, if you can cue sure. that up? What was that like for you, Pat, coming back to throw that pitch to Mark Burley? Oh, man, I was honored. My, uh, Beeston said to me, he said, I'd like you to come to Toronto and throw out the first pitch for the first game of the playoffs. And I was like, are you serious? Like, I was just – I was honored, man. I couldn't wait. I jumped in my car and left that day. I remember. And, you know, because I only lived four hours from Toronto. And I was nervous too, man. I warmed up in the tunnel and everything. Um, 
award winner. And, and I remember Burley flipped me the ball, and it took me off, kind of caught me off guard. I didn't expect him to flip the ball back to me. Back to me. The anyway, I'll let him play. And has been a valuable member of the organization since, serving in a number of capacities. Please welcome Pat Henkin. You got a good hot haircut that day, too. Yeah, I got the ball going. <laughs> How many times you're on the mound and you probably weren't nervous, and this time you're nervous coming back? Oh, I, I know. Great. Let's hear it for Pat Henkin. How did you throw in the tunnel, Pat? Oh, you, you did drop it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, that was awesome. Well, Pat, thank you. Spally, thank you, guys. You're awesome. We, uh, I know the boys got a lot out of this. Parents got a lot and great pieces of advice, great pieces of advice. Um, and it's so yeah. good that this is recorded. Guys, look back at uh, those great words from Paul Spall, Jarek, and Pat Henkin. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Hey, can Thanks I add something real quick? I, if anybody yeah. has any questions after we end the Zoom, just text Paul. And, it can, it, and between the two of us, he's got my number. So if there's any other questions after you hang up the Zoom, go, shit, I should have asked him. You know, all right? Feel free. Thank you, Pat. Good stuff, guys. Thank you. Okay, good luck. Thank right, you very much. By the way, wait. When yeah. are you guys going to let me come into Canada? Does anybody know anything? <laughs> I've been, <laughs> I've been, I've got my cabin up there, man. I, I haven't been there since December. What's some? I heard June the end of the month. June twenty first. Uh, yeah, I heard. Yeah, probably late June. Well, late they, June. didn't they just open it up for immediate family members only? Yeah. yeah. I could uh, send one of my sons down to marry one of your daughters, Mo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you need a pre we need a prenup. That's all right. <laughs> I'll see you guys. That was great. Thanks, all right, take care.